On October 25th, Toronto citizens will cast their ballot. At the same time, 200,000 permanent residents will be denied a say in city, in city leadership. Across Ontario, 130,000 students have parents who cannot vote for school board trustees. Despite many settlement and integration challenges, permanent residents work hard to belong, making major contributions to the city. As Latin Americans, we work, pay taxes, volunteer, and donate to special projects. But it must go the other way too. Toronto belongs to all its residents and its leadership should represent us all. I Vote Toronto is a community-based campaign to extend municipal voting rights to all permanent residents living in Toronto. We believe that everyone who lives in the city, in the city and uh, non-citizens alike, citizens and non-citizens alike, should have a say in how it's run. It's possible in countries as diverse as Belize, the Netherlands, Ireland and Venezuela, residents who are not citizens can vote in local elections. It can also boost electoral participation by introducing newcomers to the Canadian political system early and encouraging them to get involved. The question, first to Mr. Ford. In order, to, in order for permanent residents to vote in Toronto elections, the provincial government must amend the Municipal Elections Act. If elected mayor, will you lend your support to municipal voting rights for permanent residents? And will you call on your provincial counterparts to make the necessary legislative changes Mr. Ford. Well, I, the problem is here, and, and it's very simple, if you're allowed to vote, are you allowed to run for office? So uh, the first thing I, 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 um, I'm going to ask uh, the Premier, um, whoever it may be, as you know, this is going to be um, an issue in the next provincial election, which is a year from now. So I have no problem. If, if people want to um, be able to vote, as long as they're able to run also. Because a lot of people are saying, hold on, we can vote, but we can't run. We can't have that. Okay, yeah, I, the Canadian citizens can vote and they can run. Permanent residents right now cannot uh, vote and they cannot run. So will you be, you know, if, if, if the provincial government says that's fine, they'll be able to run for office too, then it's a level playing field. Right now we don't have a level playing field, so therefore I cannot support permanent residents voting, like I've said all, all along. I've said if they're allowed to run for office, you know what, then it's, it's fair and equal. But right now it's not fair and equal if you're saying you're only allowed to vote but you can't run for office. So you, you know what, that's up to the provincial government to decide. And I'd like to lower the voting age, I've always said this, to 16 instead of 18. Um, 16 year old kids, they drive a car, they work part time, they have jobs, they pay taxes. Um, you know what, so the problem is they can't run for public office. So again, are we gonna lower the age to 16 so they can run for office too? So all I'm saying is if you're allowed to vote, you should be allowed to run for public office, be it at your age, or uh, being a permanent resident. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Mr. Pantaloni. <clears throat> well, I'm an immigrant. I wasn't born in this country. Uh, like 50% of Torontonians, I was not born in this country. And my parents were also not born in this country either. I believe that uh, somebody who's an immigrant makes a tremendous decision when they leave their home, take, uh, you know, uproot themselves, and then try to root themselves here in this city, in this country. And we're lucky that that happens. That's why we are the people that we are and as successful as we are. I believe that you have to help people get established sooner rather than later. That's why I support 100% the idea that permanent residents should get the vote municipally. It's not a revolutionary idea. It happens in Sweden. It happens in the Netherlands. You know, and therefore, and there's 200,000 people actually who will be eligible to vote today you know, who are over 18 and permanent residents in this city if we allow them. If they pay taxes, and they do, you know, what's wrong with having them have say on the local schools, you know, the local playground, the, the local library, the local street, local issues? I think it uh, engages them, people in a civic engagement, which is better, because if you wait four years, maybe you're not used to doing it, you know, and then all of a sudden you get in a different kind of behavior. So to me, it's only fair, it's only right, and one of the first things I'll do is organize the community to go to Queen's Park and insist that they give Toronto the right to allow permanent residents the right to vote in, our, in this country in the, municipally. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Rossi. Gracias, Pedro. Buenas tardes, ¿qué tal? Mi nombre es Rocco Rossi. Como Pedro, 
Yo soy hijo de inmigrantes. Mis padres son italianos, pero entiendo algunas palabras español. Uh, entiendo más que puedo hablar, pero algunas palabras. Um, this is a, a very uh, difficult issue. Um, unlike Sweden and the Netherlands, uh, and many of the other countries that allow for permanent residents to vote in municipal elections, the threshold to citizenship in Canada is one of the lowest in the world. It's three years. And even with some of the difficulties, maybe four. At most, at most you would miss one cycle of the municipal election. There was no prouder day in my parents' life as Canadians than when they became Canadian citizens and had the right to vote. They did not feel hard done by. They wanted to vote, and so they worked hard to get uh, to citizenship. I would work extremely hard with every community in every language to move people to citizenship as quickly as possible on this front. But I do not think, when it comes to the issue of the vote, I do not think it's inappropriate to wait for citizenship. And I do not believe it's a huge hardship, so I, I, do, not, I do not support it. Thank you, Mr. Rossin. Good evening, Mr. Smitherman. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. And uh, Buenas noches. I, I apologize for being late. Tardes. <laughs> well, you speak the language, but you had a lousy answer anyway. I want to say, uh, I want to say uh, very clearly that uh, if a person makes a decision to get on an airplane in Buenos Aires or Lima and to come to Toronto and to establish your home. If when you arrive on the very first day, we are prepared to begin accepting your money as a taxpayer in your property taxes, even if you're renting, and the services that the city is providing are services that you require, then I strongly support allowing permanent residents, landed immigrants, the right to vote in municipal elections. I strongly support it. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you to all for the next issue, access to affordable housing, and I'll ask uh, Joe Pantaloni to answer first. The high cost of housing is of particular concern to new newcomer communities because generally newcomers have lower incomes and are more likely to live in poverty than non-immigrants. Recent studies have shown that 60% of newcomer households in Toronto spend more than 30% of their income on housing, and almost 30% of newcomer households spend more than 50% of their income for shelter. Although the City of Toronto has committed to investing $484 million annually in the next 10 years to help low-income residents, the number of households in need of social housing continues to increase faster than the rate at which social housing is being built. Recent surveys have shown that over 50,000 households need to move into social housing immediately. However, there is a five to 10 year waiting list. Given that this is a complex problem that will necessarily involve cooperation between city council, the federal and provincial government and various community stakeholders, we would like to ask you about what you envision the mayor's role to be in regards to this issue. Keeping in mind the complexity of the problem and the various players at stake, how would you, as mayor, tackle the issue of affordable housing? Well, thank you for that very, very important question. Uh, shelter is a basic need of human beings and needs to be provided. Now, the two-part answer. First of all, the city itself has a role and it has to do its bit. You know, for example, I committed to put in a thousand units of affordable housing on new construction each and every year to continue that. Secondly, I've also said that I will support inclusive zoning. In other words, if you build a condominium, 500 units, a certain percentage have to be built by the developer and given to the city for affordable housing. It requires provincial legislation, but I'm going to be arguing that it will happen. Thirdly, the city's got to continue on with the rejuvenation of existing stock, like Regent Park we're doing, Lawrence Heights on Lawrence and Dufferin is next, and continue on. Uh, the most important thing, however, is to remember that of all the taxes that people pay in Toronto, 8% go to the city, 92% go to the provincial and federal government. 
This is Canada's largest city, and yet we have a federal government which doesn't have a national housing strategy. They say it's none of their business, basically. Mind you, they don't have a national transit strategy either. You know, uh, also we have a province which, uh, when Mike Harris was premier, they, he downloaded Ontario housing, which was in bad shape. And we figure the city, we have $200 million that we're paying of the property taxes, which they should be paying for. And they haven't corrected that. So in my opinion, as mayor, you got to do our bit and also insist that the federal and provincial government do their bit. And that's basically my answer. And, and thank you, Thank Pedro. you. Yeah. Mr. Rossi, how would you... Thank you. How would you as mayor tackle the issue of affordable housing? First, it's important to keep uh, proper measurement, and I think it was important uh, yesterday you saw the report from Vital Signs, the Toronto Community Foundation, to show that affordability is becoming more and more of a problem each year, not less and less, despite uh, the best efforts to date. So you have to work uh, on, a couple of, uh, on a couple of levels. One, the City of Toronto is the largest landowner uh, in the city and we don't have to wait or have a discussion with the province with respect to inclusionary zoning if we're prepared to put land into into the market and as part of the condition of of selling the land a certain portion is going to be affordable housing that's something we can do that's the leadership that the mayor and the city can take the rejuvenation of the Toronto community housing stock is absolutely critical Unfortunately, the city itself is one of the worst landlords in the entire city. And some of the biggest problems we're seeing in community housing, that needs to be revitalized. And I applaud the city for the initial work at Regent Park. And, and that clearly has to be accelerated where you're leveraging the value of the land underneath, partnering with the private sector to create mixed income environments which serve not only not only to get uh, rejuvenated housing stock, but because it's mixed income, you're also going to have grocery stores coming into the area, bank branches into the area, and it pushes crime out. So that's, 30 seconds. A, that's, critical, 30 seconds. that's critical as well. Working with the not-for-profits and getting out of the shelter business and into more housing is also critical. The city spent almost $12 million building a shelter for 40 beds on Peter Street. $300,000 a shelter. If they'd handed the $12 million over to Habitat for Humanity, they would have built 100 homes for 100 needy families. The city's got to get out of the way and partner with the people who are delivering housing at a reasonable, at a reasonable cost Thank to you, open Wilson. it up to more people in the community. Mr. Smitherman. Thank you. Uh, well, we know it's a very complex question, and the, the question even acknowledged that. I think that means that there's no one single solution. Here's some of what I would do. Firstly, people that are on the list for uh, housing, many of them are housed well. They are just saying, I cannot afford the housing that I have. And I think part of what we need to shift our mindset towards is finding ways to subsidize the rents of people who are already housed but cannot afford as much as they're paying. So I believe in looking at models of shelter subsidy. The shelter system in the city of Toronto, which is funded primarily by the province, has more than 5,000 beds, but they are inadequate. They're terrible. The outcomes are bad, and they're extremely expensive. I think we need to look at how we transition some of those beds into permanent housing for people who really need it. I'm proposing next year for tenants in private housing who pay the highest rates of taxes in all of the city, a 2% reduction in the taxes, which means that if you're paying $1,000 a month in rent, approximately, you could expect to get over about $50 back in the year. It's a small amount, but it's a step in the right direction that acknowledges that we are taxing our tenants at the highest rates in all of the city of Toronto. 30 seconds. And, and I also agree with what Rocco said, which is we need to look at how we can leverage the land that we have to create some additional affordable housing. And I agree with what Joe has said, we need to remain dedicated to 1,000 units of affordable housing being constructed through the existing capital budget. Like I said before, multiple strategies to try and make a difference for as many people because we know so many people are experiencing serious hardship on the cost of living in Toronto. Thank you. Ralph Ford. 
the, affordable housing. Yeah, yeah, the problem is uh, Toronto community housing is the worst landlord. Um, you have a problem. I, I feel sorry for people when they have a hole in the wall like this or, or their toilets not working. They don't know who to turn to. Well, I'll tell you what you do. You call your counselor or you call municipal licensing and standards. You call Jim Hart's office, 392-8445. 416-392-8445. What you want to do is have a bylaw officer come over to fix the problem in your, in your unit. To getting on to the affordable housing issue is I believe that we have to subsidize the rent. Now, driving along Finch, uh, coming in here, every single way, I purposely looked, every building said, they, it said one bedroom, two bedroom, or bachelor for rent. They're offering free months, uh, uh, a free month of rent for free, they're offering free parking, they're doing everything in their power to get tenants in because of the low interest rates, people are now going out and buying uh, condos. So the, the, the private landlords are begging for people to come in here. What I want to do instead of building more government housing because we can't even take care of our existing stock is subsidize people's rent. With the money, we can take 40,000 people off the waiting list. There's people that, people that own plazas, you know the apartments above the, pla uh, above the stores? People are dying for tenants up there. There's basement apartments. People want have basement apartments. There's private huge buildings, like I said, on Finch that are, you know, a lot of units are empty. So why are we sitting back waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting? We can start using this money right now. Let's subsidize people's rent and move them right in and we can have it done. We can take 20 or 30,000, boom, right off the list by literally uh, in days. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ford. <clears throat> For beginning with Mr. Rossi, education and recreation spaces. Like other newcomers, Latin Americans are very concerned about opportunities for our children. With children under the age of 15 representing almost one third of our community, we are very troubled by the recent statistics on high school dropout levels amongst Latin American youth. A study conducted in 2006 found that Latin American teenagers were more likely than other students to fail the grade nine math and the grade 10 literacy tests, and less likely to apply to university or college. The study also found that Latin American youth were much more likely to drop out of school. A recent longitudinal study showed uh, that 37% of Latin American students entering grade nine drop out within five years. In contrast, only 23% of Canadian born students dropped out. Latin American youth are affected by their parents' migration, employment, and integration struggles, as well as their own experiences with unemployment and racism. Programs to offer recreational and vocational opportunities can offer positive pathways for youth. If elected mayor, what will you do to ensure funding for recreational and vocational programs for youth, particularly youth from immigrant communities? Mr. Rossi. Well, thank you, Pedro. This is a, a question that's near and dear to my heart because the way, uh, the way our family moved from very modest means to, to success was education. My parents focused me on education from very early uh, stages and the levels of high school dropout is a guarantee for a cycle of poverty. Um, there are some fantastic programs uh, and one which uh, Mr. Smitherman and others, uh, to, to give credit where credit is due, uh, that was started in Regent Park called Pathways to Education, which in Regent Park took, took a school population that had dropout rates in the high 50s down to the low teens, uh, which leads to incredibly different outcomes for those, for those kids. And that program is now moving across the city. It's not city direct, it's working with multiple layers of government and working with the private sector, volunteer sector, et cetera, to make that, to make that happen. That's, that, is a, that is a key program that we have to extend. Number two, the city and the school boards need to work more closely together. There are tremendous assets, recreational, uh, assets across the city, but they're not being planned as one set of assets. And so we're, we're not maximizing the value of everything that's out there. Rather than build something new, very often if the city could partner with, uh, with the school board, you could look to enhance and grow and build on existing facilities, but arrangements have to be made to be able to work together. 30 thirdly, seconds. Thirdly, I've called for there's a, there's a kind of development fee that's, uh, that's, that's generated 
when uh, developers go beyond the densities permitted in the, uh, in the official plan. They're called Section 37. Today, they all stay in the wards where the building happens. Unfortunately, that means that the wealthier wards where most of the construction has happened have gotten more amenities and more parks and more uh, recreational facilities. I think that if we're truly going to be one city, we have to share a little bit more. I'd like to see 50% of those funds put into a common pool, a matching pool, that would then help us to fund, fund priority projects in the 13 priority neighborhoods thank across you, the city. Thank you, Mr. Rossi. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Smitherman. Thank you. Well, uh, a little bit off topic maybe, but uh, my transit plan is about connecting the parts of the city because a lot of this is also about opportunity and youth employment is one of those aspects. I brought forward a youth employment strategy. I think that's one part of the solution. Mr. Rossi has already talked about pathways to education. I represented Regent Park for 10 years. That community has taught me so much and this program has come from the roots of that community. Okay, they call it community succession. They, they went on a retreat from the health center, and I know that the uh, Black Creek Health Center is uh, one of the sponsors of tonight. They went on a retreat and they said, you know what, as long as the good jobs in the community go to people from outside the community, we're not gonna get ahead. And they decided that the way to address that was to make sure that the kids graduated from high school. Now Regent Park, still a pretty poor community, has rates of graduation from high school and progress to post-secondary education at the levels as high as the most affluent neighborhoods in all of Toronto. This we need to find a way to bring further and further. The mayor can bring voice to this and help to bring some of the private sector dollars. Then we need to look at uh, uh, recreation programs. I propose a recreation renaissance. In time for the Pan Am Games, when these Latin American countries are gonna come here, we wanna be able to show that we have our infrastructure and our people in better shape. Youth employment programs, like I mentioned, and agreement with Mr. Rossi that the city needs to work better with the school boards. Right now, very bad attitudes between these different uh, bureaucracies. A school pool is bad, but a school, but a pool in a, in a city recreation facility is good. Water is water, swimming is swimming, opportunity is opportunity. We need to recognize this and get these facilities connected. I propose the emergence of hubs and a one single point of contact. So you wanna do a community event, you can go on one website that is about the French school board, the Catholic school board, the public board, the city facility. We need to bring all of those together and create more opportunities that way. A combination of factors to address this underlying and big challenge in the community. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. <laughs> Mr. Ford. What, what we have to do is uh, from um, st uh, stopping Latin American kids from dropping out of school, it's simple. They are phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal athletes. They love to play um, soccer. They're musicians. They're great. And, and you have to give them that carrot to keep them in school. You can't just tell kids to go to school and say, study, 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 study. You have to have some fun while you're at school. I'm a high school football coach. I deal with kids every day between the ages of 14 and 18, which is the most critical time of their lives when they start um, hanging around the right people or the wrong people. I've started a football foundation, and this has helped kids get out of gangs, get out of jail, and, get, and stay in school. I know this is what we could do with, with McGuigan, the Catholic school just up the street. We got C.W. Jeffries and Westview here. I started football programs at those schools. It has turned the school around. The girls follow. They have the cheerleading team. And then the, the music comes in. They have the marching bands and everything. The school spirit comes in. This is what we have to do. And we have to start at the high school. They're saying community centers. Ladies and gentlemen, we have community centers. They're called high schools. All we have to do is work, just like uh, Mr. Ross and Mr. Smitherman said, we have to work with the boards and we have to work with the province to let us use their facilities and not charge us an arm and a leg. We have to enter into a partnership to say, yes, we'll let you use our, our gym and our auditorium at night. And you know what? It, 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 it makes so much sense, but there's so many times that high schools are completely empty. And we have to encourage these, these uh, young um, boys and girls that, you know, they're, they, it's very important they have to study, but you have to give them a reason to go to school. And if, they, if you're playing sports or soccer, more specifically, um, I coach at Don Bosco. We have one of the best football programs and soccer programs, and the whole soccer program's all pretty well Latin Americans. 30 and, seconds, and, they, and they go through these people like they're standing still. 
and they're scoring goals left, right, and center. And then they get scholarships. Then university coaches start calling them. This is what gets kids interested, and they stay in school. But you, can't just, you just can't ram and stuff and say, study, 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 study. You have to have fun. And you know what? The music, the arts, the culture, the, the sports is the side that you have fun with at school, and that's how you keep kids um, in, in school. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Ford. <laughs> Mr. Pantaloni. Well, the question, if you notice, is what will you do as mayor to ensure funding for recreation and vocational program for youth, particularly youth from immigrant communities? You know, and people spoke about some interesting programs, and some are very good. Community hubs, working with the 16 organization that sponsored this e evening, you know, and the priority neighborhoods, working with the educational system. But the question is funding. You know, I'm the one that believes that you gotta continue to invest, spend money, be it in transit, be it in seniors. For seniors, for example, I want them to stay in their own homes and I'll make sure that if they make less than $50,000 as, as a household, they get their taxes frozen for the next four years, that way they can stay in their home. And young people, like Priorities Neighborhood. You should know that Mr. Ford wants to cut the city budget by a billion dollars in the next four years. You know, I want to make sure there's 4,000 less people working in the city. Also, Mr. Ford voted against, you know, the community grants Center for Specialty Speak People, Jenny Finch Community and Family Centers, organization, by the way, which provide these kind of programs, as well as preparing meals for wheels for seniors who are stranded at home. That's his vision of funding for this kind of program. Mr. Smitherman has said that he wants to cut 4,000 people who work at City Hall or the agency that we have, and he wants to save $300 million. You know, Mr. Smitherman has the goal, however, to tell you that he wants to give more opportunities. I don't know what math or high school he went to, but I've never learned that you could provide more when you freeze taxes, which means you, are, you get, collect less money and you have less money to spend because you want to cut something like $300 million for the city budget. How can you be providing more with $300 million less? You know, I will ask you the question. So frankly, you know, if, you gotta read between the lines here. You know, in my view, I'm not calling for a tax freeze except for seniors, like I mentioned before, seconds, who are needy. And, and, uh, you know, and I believe that the city's got to invest. That's how you get a better city, by investing in our young people, our transit, and so forth, not by cutting back. I feel I'm surrounded by a bunch of mini Mike heiresses, to tell you the truth, in their approach to the city building. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Pantalone. <laughs> we'll start with Mr. Smitherman, the last question. Access to employment. Internationally trained workers struggle to find fairly paid and meaningful employment, employment that allows them to contribute their skills and experience. Latin American workers are no exception. Despite higher than average rates of university education, Latin Americans face higher than average unemployment, 10% compared to only 7.4% in the general population. Both employer incentives and legislative change are needed to improve employment opportunities for internationally trained workers. Our community has identified paid internships and employment equity as high priority strategies for opening doors to immigrant workers. Existing internship programs are highly successful with up to 80% of interns moving on to full-time employment in their field. More internship opportunities are needed to allow newcomers to contribute to the economic prosperity of Toronto. The city can show leadership by increasing the number of municipal internships, issuing a call to action to the private sector, and providing funding for nonprofits wishing to offer internships. Meanwhile, strong employment equity legislation and practice is needed to ensure equitable access to permanent employment. The city can review and strengthen its own employment equity practices while exerting pressure on the province to bring back employment equity legislation. Within the next decade, immigration will contribute a full 100% of net labor force growth in Canada. And much of that growth will be reflected here in Toronto. If elected mayor, how do you propose to increase access to fair and meaningful employment for internationally trained workers. Thank you. I just want to let you know that uh, this is uh, the last question that I'm going to be able to participate in because I'm headed, uh, as I think uh, these other folks are, to other side of town, and I do apologize for that. Uh, the Color of Poverty Network, which works on many of the issues that you've mentioned, rated each of the candidates on a variety of issues and gave me the best rating at B+. 
And here's, I think, part of why they did that. Number one, the mayor has certain powers. The biggest power that the mayor of Toronto has is the power of voice. If I'm elected as your mayor, I will bring the power of voice to this issue of the Canadian experience trap. It can no longer be tolerable in a city like Toronto or in the country of Canada that we give you a rating point system immigration-wise in a home country that as soon as you land at Pearson Airport is erased and you are told to start over. And this is the too common reality in our society today. The mayor can call greater attention to this. Some employers are good, some are very good, and some are very, very poor. The city of Toronto must be at the top marks in terms of being an organization, recognizing not just diversity as our strength, as a motto, but making sure that we are giving opportunity and not creating this barrier of the Canadian experience trap. More uh, internships is part of that. Mentorship programs at the city are part of that. But the city has a policy on the books since 2003 that they have never chosen to hold themselves accountable for. They said in a policy, and it's a good policy, that visible minorities, aboriginals, disabled, and women in particular should be given a focus for opportunities in employment and in purchasing. That is, that we should buy from suppliers from those groups. But they have never done anything to track their progress. If I'm elected mayor, I will introduce a tracking system and I will connect the compensation of the senior executives of the City of Toronto to the progress they make on these matters. 30 Toronto, seconds, please. Sorry, we have to give real life to this expression, diversity our strength. If you elect me as your mayor, I will make this my priority. Thank you very much. Mr. Ford. It, Well, it's. Well, we're going to take me longer. We all have to go, so. That's right. Yeah, well, he's got to we'll, start. Maybe we're going to take different go routes. Somewhere. I'm going to do my best to be there. Well, you drive slowly, do you? <laughs> he's got to go. Mr. Somewhere. Ford. <laughs> go ahead, please. Anyways, please. Uh, if we have uh, a little bit more to go, and it'd be great if we could finish up uh, properly. Well, it's Mr. about Ford. jobs, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm a businessman. I own a company that employs 250 people. When people come to me with a resume, I, I, I've hired so many people, and if I couldn't hire them, I've given them to our suppliers, to our customers. I can find people jobs. My father started a label company, Deco Labels and Tags, in 1962. When I came back from Carleton University, we had 50 employees. Now, we expanded into Chicago, New Jersey. We employ over 250 people. Just think about it. Labels and stickers. Every product needs a label or a sticker. You give me your resume, I send it out to our suppliers, I send it out to our customers. We deal with thousands and thousands of companies. So when people say, can I get you jobs? Absolutely. I've got a proven track record of getting people well-paying jobs. For newcomers, especially in this country, I always, always help these people out. And, and I invite you, you want to send me your resume, I will send it out to a lot of people and we'll try to help you get jobs. I've done it. I've helped out many, many people up in Rexdale. I landed the largest development in Toronto's history. It was a billion dollar uh, development called Woodbine Live, creating 10,000 jobs. Every single uh, councillor supported me. That's, that's how I'm going to run the city. I'm going to make sure people are, are, are employed. And, but I don't. Let me tell you what I don't agree with, but Mr. Pantaloni agrees with. Free parking for councillors. We make $100,000 a year. Last year, councillors spent $20,000 parking for free. When you go downtown, you have to pay $15 or $20. We park for free. We get on the bus for free. We get a free Metro Pass. I voted no. He votes yes. He, should, we, he thinks we should be able to get on the bus for free. We're making $100,000 a year. Golfing, we golf for free. You guys pay gas, $40,000. We get free gas. Counselors, that's absolutely wrong. Counselors shouldn't get free. Free zoo seconds, passes. Please. Free restaurants. Last year alone, just on all these counselors' perks, don't forget, we make $100,000 a year. On top of that, you're telling me we should be able to eat at restaurants for free, have gas for free, get all this free stuff, and you're paying for it? It's absolutely wrong. I, I, I said no to all this. Mr. Pantley only said, yes, we deserve to park for free. We deserve to get free gas, free food. It's absolutely wrong. That's the difference. Thank you, Thank you very Ford. much. Thank you. Well, before I answer the question, I do not golf, so I don't take advantage of that. 
I do not you charge for gas. Driving. I take transit or walk, so I don't charge for gas. And thirdly, I don't eat at restaurants and charge it to the city. So therefore, so much for that, Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford happens to be a multimillionaire because his father was yeah, very right. successful I wish. I business. Wish. Wish. And therefore, he figures that you know, you don't need a budget to do newsletters, to do phone calls, and otherwise Heartbeat. deal with the constituents because maybe he's not there as often as he needs to be at City Hall. But anyway, aside from that, the question is jobs. And I believe, you know, I worked for Costi for a year and a half, immigrant settlement agent. I was a vocational counselor. My job was to help people get into ESL programs and get themselves upgraded so they could go into apprenticeship programs and so forth and get qualified. I understand this issue. You know, uh, let me tell you, the city has, uh, has to improve its hiring policies. We're doing a not too bad job. We hired hundreds of young people, for example, from the priority neighborhoods, which are nowhere not being hired before. But we got to do better. And our procurement policy is important. And the city has a capital budget for the next 10 years between transit, water and sewage, roads, et cetera, which is uh, $25 billion you know, for the next 10 years, which means 300,000 jobs are going to be either kept or created. You know, that's investing as opposed to you know, watching the pennies lock in the door and hiding in the basement, which Mr. Ford would like to suggest because we can't afford it. You know, so I think we got to have better procurement policies. We've got to work better with the unions. And the labor movement supports me, by the way. Uh, and, and in terms of doing apprenticeship programs, and I'm going to enhance that. And thirdly, we've got to deal with private sector. Yesterday, we did a, an all candidates, Heen and Blaney, which is a, a law firm. And they told us in the next couple of years, they've hired 16 interns. 30 seconds, you know, uh, you know, So that they could be trained to be lawyers from priority neighborhoods, the Finch Corridor, Western, parts of Scarborough. These are the kind of programs we got to do. And I honestly believe that most Torontonians care about our city, love our city, and want to help out. As a mayor, I want to focus on that because I'm an immigrant myself. I know how hard it is. And frankly, we, we can get a better society if we invest and work more closely together. And that's what I plan to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rocco Rossi. Well, first off, I think it's very admirable that Mr. Ford runs a football program, and I think it's admirable that if you send his, your resume to him, that he does send it to people. But that's not a systemic solution. That's nice if he wanted to be the mayor of Aurelia. But we're talking about, we're talking about a city of 2.6 million, million people with very complex issues. We need a complex solution. It's not going to be done by individual phone calls. And thankfully, the question that you asked has many of the answers right in it, in terms of paid internship and, mem and mentorship. There are great programs, not just in the city, but the, the mayor does have to give voice to the private sector uh, and, and encourage them, as the uh, Heenan Blakey case, uh, to, uh, to participate in it. Maitri, a, a fantastic not-for-profit, has a board matching service that allows that allows people with skills, but perhaps not Canadian experience, to put their, their skills together into an inventory that then gets matched with opportunities for paid internship and volunteer opportunities as well. In terms of being able to pay for some of the additional internships in the city itself or in helping to fund not-for-profits, one of the things I want to clarify, because Mr. Pantalone's remarks didn't, and he sort of lumped me in with the mini Mike Harris's, is I'm the only one, the only one, who is not calling for any immediate tax cuts or freezes. Right? I've put out a financial plan, you can see it at RoccoRossi.com, the Board of Trade, the Sun, the Globe, independent economic analysts say it's clear, it's detailed, it is applicable, it's reasonable, it's prudent, because you know, as I know, that there's no free lunch. 30 seconds, there please. have been spending problems over the last several years. We're not going to solve it overnight and give massive uh, uh, tax cuts. Initially, that's irresponsible. It can only be accomplished if you then cut services, which I refuse to allow to have happen. So if you want someone who has a rational plan, who is looking at these issues systemically, and who's not going to try to bribe you with your own money and beggar the system that you need to help those who most need the help, then I encourage you to vote for Rocco Rossi on Thank October you, 25th. Thank Muchas you. gracias. We have to go.
Thank you to all the candidates. If there's time, this, uh, no, there's, I, there's no time, there. unfortunately. There. Thank you very much again to uh, the three candidates, including Mr. Smitherman, who, who's already left. Before we say good night, I want to remind everyone that civic participation is also about getting out and voting. Tonight, we would like to share a brochure that is around. Some of you might have already seen it. If not, on the way out, please. Uh, which we like to call the tool that we all need to know how, why, and where to vote. It's called Your Vote, Your Choice. And it is available in Spanish and in English. If you have uh, not, gone, uh, not gotten one yet, please make sure you do before you leave tonight. And please share it with those who uh, weren't here tonight. And uh, that would be great. I also want to remind everyone that there is that question box, which will also end up in the lobby, uh, a sign-up sheet as well, so that we can continue the discussion uh, and the organizers can stay in touch with all of you. One more thing, clpctoronto at gmail.com, clpctoronto at gmail.com. CLPC stands for Campaña Latinoamericana de Participación Cívica, the Latin American Campaign for Civic Participation. Good night. Thank you, everyone, okay. and buenas noches. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Buenas noches.